als erstes Vandana Shiva zu uns zu sprechen. Ich stelle sie kurz vor für alle, die sie noch nicht kennen. Sie ist Umweltaktivistin, Bürgerrechtlerin, Vordenkerin des Ökofeminismus, ganz nebenbei noch Doktor der Physik meiner Beobachtung. Sie ist 1993 ausgezeichnet mit dem Friedensnobelpreis und wie kaum eine andere steht sie in der globalen Öffentlichkeit im Kampf gegen Biopiraterie und global agierende Konzerne wie Monsanto, die sich maßgeblich an der Verknappung von Allgemeingütern beteiligen und den Menschen Lebensgrundlage bauen. Frau Schieber, Sie kommen aus einem Land, in dem es vielfältige soziale Bewegungen gibt, die zum Teil auch global agieren. Medico International ist Teil eines globalen Netzwerkes, das von Indien seinen Ursprung genommen hat, das People's Health Movement. Welche Gegenkräfte gegen den global entfesselten Kapitalismus sehen Sie? Worin liegen deren Möglichkeiten und deren Grenzen? Ich bitte Sie, das Wort sein. Let me begin by greetings of solidarity to Medico International for their 40th anniversary. That's already a sustainable organization to have crossed more than 25 and to have started in 68 and to still exist. In a way, the issues that were addressed by young people in 68 are the issues that have become life and death issues for a large number of people across the world. And as the greed of corporate capitalism pushes humanity more and more to the edge, it becomes more and more desperate. And the desperation for me is signified by trying to appropriate the last drop of water, the last inch of land that a peasant farms in India, the last seed that we have grown, and actually even the last bit of air, because the, the climate catastrophe, the best solution that could be created after Kyoto, which everyone says the European Union was way ahead and now the Americans who were blocked by Bush say they'll copy the system, but the highest achievement was to set in place trade in pollution, to set in place a way to keep pollution going. And of course, when you have a world in which the Euro sign right across the window from us <laughs> becomes the center of organizing our imagination, then the more we can keep the euro a sign afloat, the more we imagine we are saving the world. Because the world has become the euro and even the poor collapsing dollar. <laughs> I think one of the most important challenges for solidarity in our times is to be able to deal with the fictions and constructions that capital has created to dominate our worlds, including taking over our minds. I've of course come from the country India, which was ruled for a few years by the East India Company, one of the first corporations. And in 1857, we had our first movement of independence, where in, in British history, it's called the Sepoy Mutiny. In our history, it's called the first movement of independence. And that was the end of East India Company rule. But everyone in India recognizes that we are back to company rule. There was one East India Company then, there are five seed giants who are also the pharmaceutical giants, who are also the agrochemical giants. And a large part of my own work's inspiration came from the big pharmaceutical industry, which was becoming the biotech industry, laying out very clearly that by the turn of the century, five corporations would dominate health and food. And for me, that was dictatorship. That was not economic democracy. So we have seen a mutation where democracy has moved from being off the people, for the people, by the people, to being off the corporations, for the corporations, by the corporations. And solidarity in today's world means dealing with that corporate power. 
To the extent we keep it invisible, the extent we keep silent about it, we will never ever be able to mark out the next step of the defenses of our freedom and next step of our liberations. Partly because they've sold as many limousines and Mercedes and BMWs in this country, now they must sell them to us. And to do that, they must mine the last bit of iron ore, the last, last bit of aluminium. This last stage of corporate greed is pitted directly against the rights of the poor to their very survival. Part of the assault is through indirect impact. Large part of it is by directly taking the common goods, the commons that sustain life and livelihoods and turning it into corporate property. Take just three sectors, the medicine issue and the seed issue. The reach of patents now after the World Trade Organization and the Trade Related Intellectual Property Rights Agreement, the reach is so wide that these corporations would not rest till they monopolize every living system on this planet. My own work is dedicated to keeping life free, keeping seeds accessible to farmers, making sure that if we can produce medicine at 10,000 rupees, we don't have to end up paying 100,000 rupees for a corporation for the same product. We are in the middle of a food crisis. The Financial Times today and the Wall Street Journal talk about the new plan of the World Bank. But the new plan of the World Bank is the old plan of the World Bank that created the food crisis in the first place. We're now going to move our tax money to subsidize more genetically engineered seeds deployed faster in the south, more fertilizers deployed faster in the south. And of course, there are corporations like Swayze and Vivendi and RWE who would like to privatize every drop of water. Now, in each of these sectors, they have worked out what they want. In seed, if every farmer had to pay royalties every year for seed used, it's a trillion dollar market. They've already defined it as their profits. So they will use every form of terror, every form of fear, every form of threat to force farmers to give up their freedoms. I remember years ago, it must be 96, in Leipzig, I stood in a church with a farmer called Joseph Albrecht, a German farmer who was only growing seed and sharing it with neighbors, and he was sued because the corporations would like every farmer to buy seed from them every year. 1,500 farmers have been sued in the United States. 200,000 farmers in India have been pushed to suicide by the same system. Water privatization, also $1 trillion of profit if every day every person's thirst had to be quenched by paying market prices for water. And we have watched what market prices mean. It means Coca-Cola can steal water from a community, uh, 1.5 to 2 million liters per day, every plant of Coca-Cola takes that kind of water. And it took the courage of a woman called Mai Lama in Kerala to say, why should we keep walking longer miles for water while Coca-Cola walks away with our water and leaves it polluted? She, along with about 10 women six years ago, said, we will not let you operate. They started a civil disobedience in front of the gates of Coca-Cola. We worked very strong with the small community. That plant is closed. <laughs> Monsanto has tried everything under the sun to make it illegal for Indian farmers to have their own seed. We've done what Gandhi did way back in 1930 when the British wanted to monopolize salt. Just out of the blue, they wrote a law and said only the British could make salt, Indians making salt, 
would be treated as engaging in a crime. Now, sitting in this heat as you're perspiring, you will realize how much salt is important in hot climates. You're losing salt. You've got to replenish it. And Gandhi walked to the Dandi beach and said, nature gives it for free. We need it for our survival. We will continue to make salt and we will disobey your law. He gave this the name Satyagraha. The first time he actually practiced it was in South Africa against the apartheid regime, where the apartheid regime was dividing people according to race. And Gandhi and the Indian colleagues living there had said, we are one. We are one black, brown, and white. We are one citizenry. 100 years later, we are now searching how to stay free when corporate control and corporate dictatorship would like to rob us of every one of our freedoms. One of the illusions through which they've had a somewhat easy time is by constantly making us believe that our giving up economic freedom is actually a gain in economic freedom. And that is done by substituting economic freedom as producers, as workers, as farmers, as teachers, as nurses, as doctors, and replacing it with the economic freedom of the supermarket, the right to buy, the freedom to buy. We are being shrunk in our humanity to be consumers. And to the extent consumerism becomes our experience of freedom, we participate in the capitalism of catastrophe. So 68, what were people talking about? But a simpler life, a life with the solidarity, humanity was put before the material consumerism that was being sold. Today, consumerism has become the ultimate cancer on the planet, and it has a limitless appetite for resources, a takeover of our commons. Solidarity in our times means defending the commons from the local to the global level. From that tiny little lake or tank in our town or our village to the atmosphere that is being privatized through this new carbon trade. In fact, Stern, who wrote the big report for the UK government on climate change, has written very clearly Emissions trading, in effect, is allocating property rights to the atmosphere. But who gets these property rights? The polluters. In environmental law, we have a very famous principle called the polluter should pay. Carbon trading has turned this on its head into the polluter gets paid. If we have to resist the takeover of our commons, we cannot be bystanders and watch while corporate states do jugglery amongst themselves to defend corporate wealth and make us pay. Make us pay also in times of sacrificing our future. Continuing on a path where human species won't have a future. But to join in the solidarity to defend the commons, the commons that gives us the vital life support, solidarity has to go beyond the old solidarities. It was fine when industry was national and rooted to have a union. The trade union was effective enough. But the union of uniformity is not effective enough when capital is mobile, it's global, it's reach, it's limitless. We too have to have a limitless reach. But every one of us cannot be everywhere. So we have to be everywhere through solidarity. And the new solidarity has to be a solidarity of alliances of diversity. Let me just give you two that have worked tremendously. In the food movement, we made a difference because we didn't let farmers fight only as farmers and consumers fight only as eaters. The eaters joined the producers to say, we will create food systems that sustain the earth, that provide food to all, and provide health to all. And it's working. We haven't had to wait 
until states change the policies to create the new boom in alternative systems of food provisioning. More recently, the land grab issue I mentioned about how, how you know, your, the, the Mercedes is moving, Benz is moving to India, BMW is moving to India. They need land. These factories are being built on land grab from peasants. I have just had a meeting with the trade unions of Fiat who are now working in solidarity with the peasants uprooted by the car factory of Tata and Fiat in West Bengal in Singur. Where would we have imagined 10 years ago unions of a car factory and peasants becoming one in solidarity? Once we realize that diversity is not a problem for solidarity, we realize that we can reach out in a whole new way of being on this earth. I have called it earth democracy. We have to reclaim what being human on the planet means in 2008. And being human on the planet in 2008 means thinking of the last person who's being denied food, being feeling one with the victims of every unjust war being fought on this planet. And while we reach out in solidarity and embrace and inclusion, defending with fearlessness every common good that has kept society going and kept our human survival and reproduction going. The ultimate resistance is the resistance against fear. And the easiest resistance against fear is the recognition that the laws that we must obey are the laws of justice, the laws of ecology, they are not the corporate laws that are being ingeniously put in place day after day after day to control our lives and prevent us from action and shrink our existence into the kind of fear that this country knew once upon a time. The whole world is being turned into a rule by a Hitler, except the Hitler now is corporations and their friends in governments. Our own offices have been closed in India in the last few weeks. So when I say this is about fascism, this is about the ultimate closure of every freedom that we need to survive, I'm not using these words trivially because I know the pain this country went through. We cannot afford to have it globalized. We cannot afford to have it brought as the last way of silencing a human species longing to be free in community and in solidarity. And I feel convinced that our love, our compassion can see us through to the next stage. And we will get together for another 40-year celebration. Thank you. Mm -hmm.